Edu Cafe is digital this year. Golf Mathimum presents Edu Cafe Season 6. Uh, and of course, uh, thank you, Revati, for introducing me and also uh, Team Edu Cafe for this opportunity. Firstly, I have to congratulate you on this amazing virtual um, Edu Cafe this year. I'm sure it took a lot of effort and hard work, and I um, congratulate you on all the efforts that you have taken. So, um, to all the parents and teachers who joined me today, thank you so much for joining me from all across the globe. And I'm going to do something very practical because all of you probably since the pandemic are stuck with online classes and you know that children are also very exhausted and we're also very exhausted webinars and everything. So I'm going to make it uh, very, very practical because I want you to use your hands because you might have uh, heard me say in many, many occasions, the hand needs a brain, the brain needs a hand. Because if you do not use your hands to learn something, it doesn't internalize. And therefore, I would request you to please have a piece of paper with you uh, and join me as we work with uh, several areas. So if you could quickly uh, find a piece of paper, make it a square and then make it a triangle. So basically we need one triangle with which we're going to learn. So what is it that I'm going to speak about today with you? Um, many, many times I've spoken to you about adolescence and today's session especially, uh, considering the pandemic and the mental health challenges that have come uh, to all our children, I would like for us to understand how we can, as teachers and as parents, be very, very supportive. So I'm going to use three triangles in this one triangle so that we understand as parents and as teachers how we can go about it. So I'm hoping that you all have a piece of paper, quickly make it a triangle. I'm sure all of you as children have used folded paper, so you know how to make a, a triangle out of a piece of paper, so have a triangle. Now, what is most important about the triangle is that unless all the three lines are joined, it doesn't become a triangle, it's just three lines, right? Similarly, when you work, work with a child, work with a teenager, if these lines are not integrated, you will notice that there will be behavior problems or learning problems or issues that the child has in mental health. So this is where we're going to look at how we can, as parents and as teachers, bring about an integration. So I hope you have the paper ready. Now with this paper, once you have made one triangle, I asked you, uh, I said we'll make four triangles out of it. So how do we make four triangles out of one triangle? So I have one triangle here, and I'd like you to now fold it this way. So you made this. So out of this, you'll have two triangles, and the third triangle will be this way. The center is the fourth triangle. So I hope. All of you can quickly make this because remember when we use our hands it's easier to remember what will happen is even after the session you'll be able to remember otherwise just looking at a session on a screen it'll be like watching a movie you may remember one or two parts but you may not be able to internalize the learning you may not be able to make it practical so if i was in person it would have been a completely different experience but since we're doing it on a screen we need to make sure that we use our hands as much as possible okay so i hope all of you can quickly make this uh, on uh, on your on, a, on your piece of paper now this we're going to use these outer triangles okay so i hope you have a piece uh, a pen or a pencil that you can use okay so the first triangle that i'm going to use is this con this triangle on your left right so you're going to start with this and this triangle i'm going to call the triangle of nurturing or the nurture triangle now what does this mean i'd like you to understand the moment i say nurture nurture is what can i do as a parent or as a teacher to support my child. So for this, there are three R's. And what I'd like you to do is to write down the three R's, one on each corner as I go through it. So the first R in the top corner, you're going to work on reflection. Now, what happens is with our education system being one where we have a lot of recall, a lot of memory, uh, we don't allow children to actually go inwards. We don't actually ask them to think about what is it that you're learning? How can you do this better? We don't have these reflection tasks. Now, when there is no reflection, you can be 100% sure that the child is going to struggle with problem solving, is going to struggle with taking responsibility, is going to struggle with deciding what careers to choose for the future. So you may get onto Edu Cafe, you may go and see all the virtual stalls, you may even meet with some people from different universities, but when it comes to a decision that has to be made, unless the child or the adolescent has a regular practice of reflection, their answer may not be very, very decisive. So if you tell them, would you like to do this? They'll say, yeah, okay. And if you tell them, shall we do this? They'll be you know, wanting to do the new thing. They may not be very, very strong. Children who have strong reflection skills, 
apart from other things, have very good mental health because they have good problem solving skills and they're able to anticipate challenges and solve them. Children who do not have reflection on the other hand, of course, are very, very indecisive, are unable to make decisions. They often are not very assertive. They are not able to assert their needs because they're not aware of their needs. And more importantly, so what happens is they always rely upon somebody else to decide for them. And so by the time they find their passion, by the time they find out what they can be good at, they've wasted many, many years. So this is where the first skill is reflection. What can you and I as a teacher do? Now, the first thing that we can do as uh, teachers or as parents is what I technically call a debrief session. At the end of every day, now if you're in school, at the end of the school day, at home, just before your child is going to sleep, you could have what is called a reflection activity or a debrief activity. Now in this, this must be done two ways. It's not like you're going to do an interrogation. You'd say, okay, I'll ask you some questions, give me some answers. It's not done that way. There's a mutual sharing involved in the debrief. So what do we do in this debrief? The first question, both of you share what happened during your day. So you can say, you know, today in office, this happened. What happened in your school or what happened in your online class? Is there something that you really liked about today? So you ask certain questions to just recall what happened during the day. The second question, which is very important, you'll ask, what did you learn today and what made you grow today? Because very often in every day's experience, you will notice that there will be a learning and growing component. Now, for me, for example, today's virtual conference or virtual edu cafe is a learning experience and I'm quite excited. And you can see how excited I am because I went and made papers and all of these things. I've been teaching online for almost nine, 10 months now, but a virtual conference like this, seeing a lobby, seeing an auditorium, it was a very beautiful experience for me as well. So in my debrief today, I would definitely mention that you know, this is what I've learned today. So what did you learn? How did you grow today? And this need not be necessarily a positive experience. It could be also a very challenging experience where you tried to have a conversation with somebody and they were very aggressive and you learned how to step back and not get into a conflict. So it could be even an unpleasant experience that taught you how to grow, but you have to ask the second question. The third question, which is very important is you can ask what was most challenging about today and how would you like to change it? And this question is very important because it starts triggering the areas in the brain that will help them with problem solving. And the fourth question, very beautifully put, will be what skills did you acquire today or what skills did you have that you were able to rediscover or discover today? Because very often what happens is when you end with the skill aspect and how they were able to do it, they stay in a very, very calm and a very positive frame of mind. And they understand that the debrief Though it may have challenging parts, it also has an acquisition or a skill acquisition part that leaves me very, very positive. So when you leave, when you end the debriefing session with a high, where the child knows or the adolescent knows that he or she has learned the skill, they start feeling very confident about it. And when they go to sleep after that, they the subconscious mind actually works on those things and they're able to work uh, wake up in the next morning with higher level of awareness of what they need to do in the next day. So this is one way in which reflection can be dealt with. Now you may ask, though the session today is more for parents of adolescents, I would ask you to even try this activity even for children as young as three years, because children do become aware of this debriefing activity very early and they're able to bring it into their in everyday routine. Now, when this becomes an everyday habit, you'll notice that learning and improvement become everyday processes. Now, the second technique that you can use, or the second skill that we need to use in the nurturing uh, triangle in the reflection aspect is problem solving skills. Now, many parents, when you reach out for counseling, you actually tell me that, you know, my child is always complaining, does not try anything new. I have to push him or I have to push her to try new things. Or they always push me to come and speak to the teacher in a new place. He or she refuses to work. Uh, or speak to somebody new. They don't want to try anything new. They avoid situations or they get aggressive. They don't know how to deal with the situation. They get very aggressive, lose their temper. And also they find them very inconsistent and irregular. Now, some aspects of this can be because of anxiety, but many times it's telling us that the child or the adolescent does not have problem solving skills. Now, for example, in the younger classes, in the primary classes, this is the child that keeps coming back and saying, Amma, I lost this. I left my razor at the table. I left the box there, I did this, I did that. They're always complaining, but they're not yet able to understand that I can solve this problem by being more responsible, by taking care of my things. They don't know how to organize themselves. In the older classes, it will always be, they're making fun of me, they're not listening to me. There can be genuine bullying, I'm not saying no, but many of these children do not know how to get into that situation and solve the relationship problem. So they constantly look like they're complaining about what has happened. 
So considering this, how can I as a parent develop problem solving? Because it's a very important skill in reflection. So the first thing that you need to do is most important, especially because you're working with adolescents, ask your teenager, how can I be supportive? Because before you, the child wants your help, before the adolescent wants your help, don't rush and say, come, I'll tell you what to do. Because many times children are processing that information, they are finding solutions, but it may not have worked immediately. So find out how you can help. So tell them, okay, I can do these things. These are things I will not be able to do. You can even start off like that. The second thing that's more important, don't rush to. So when they've narrated a problem to you, don't immediately say, you know, go and do this. What you can do is ask questions which will increase their insight and awareness of what they have to do and let them generate some solutions. So if they say, you know, these children are making fun of me. So the question, even if it is bullying, you can ask them, so what do you think can be done here? Is this a situation that you will be able to overcome on your own or do you require more support, say from your teacher or somebody else in the school? So you need to ask questions so that the child is able to understand, will I be able to deal, it, deal with it on my own? Do I need more support? Or they're making a decision about what course to choose or what college to choose. What you can do is to give them all the information that is required and say, okay, of all these colleges, which one do you think had the course that was most suitable for you? So you need to ask questions so that the child or the adolescent is able to look at those questions and and be able to find the solutions that they're looking for. The next is most important, support don't shame. Because sometimes their answers or the decisions that they make may not be very, very good or may not be the best for them at that time. Don't shame them by saying, see, that person is able to do it. Why are you not able to do it? Please support them by saying, I know that you're given these solutions, but I feel that one or two things can be changed here. Because when you reach this whole thing with a supportive eye, it's very, very easy for this uh, child to say, okay, they are going to support me even if I make a few mistakes. So that way, the decision-making skill and the way in which they're able to solve the problem becomes much better. The next is, of course, allow them to choose what method they want to choose. They may generate many solutions. Let them choose what is most uh, beneficial for them. Let them try it and then do a review in your debrief so that they find out is it working, is it not working. So slowly over a period of few weeks, you can generate a solution together. And if you still feel that your child is not able to solve it after having tried this method, you could, from your experience, suggest two or three methods and say, would you like to try something like this? Because when you give them the chance to solve their own problems and then in the end, when it doesn't work, you give your solution, you're always letting the child know that you value his intelligence, value her skills and all that. But at the same time, if something doesn't work, you will always be there. So these will be within the reflection aspect. So the corner, you will have reflection written in one corner. And within that, you have debriefing and problem solving. Now we're going to the second aspect, the, in the same triangle, we're going to the second part, where you're going to write the second R, which is very important, and probably something that I speak about all the time, relationships. Now, one of the biggest challenges in current generation is that they have a lot of loneliness. I'm quoting the work of Dr. Vivek Murthy, who was formerly the Surgeon General in the United States. Now, in his book, he says that there are three basic types of loneliness that is very, very common in the world today. And the first type of loneliness is what you call intimate or emotional loneliness. In this, it's a need for every human being, more so with young children and teenagers, to have a relationship where they can share personal uh, ideas or something that is troubling them and things like that. They want to feel extremely supported in this. Now, when this is missing, what happens is they start you know, going on to Instagram, going on to different apps, trying to distract themselves. Because this pain that is coming from the loneliness is so difficult. They find that, you know, if I have so many followers, if I have so many likes, I'm somehow more um, liked or I'm more not lonely. They keep an illusion or they create an illusion that they are not lonely. Unfortunately, that's not a very healthy thing to do. And that leads, one of the primary reasons for gadget addiction comes from that sense of loneliness. The second problem, or the second level of loneliness, the type of loneliness is relational loneliness or social loneliness. This is the loneliness that is very, very typically this generation as well, which is the loneliness that comes because the quality of the friendships is very, very poor. If you notice that we grew up at a time where we had healthier relationships, we had the, we didn't have so many gadgets, we didn't have so many distractions, we had healthier relationships. And therefore, this generation, because they do not have this quality relationships, they struggle from this relational or uh, social loneliness. The third type of loneliness is what, what's called the collective loneliness, which 
for the teenager is the lack of a network. You know, sometimes we all had a safety net when we were growing up. If there was a problem, there would be a set of cousins or there would be a set of friends who would always be there for us. But now that kind of world has changed because the world has become overall extremely competitive that people are waiting for people to fall down and that support is not there. When these three types of loneliness are so high, you will see it in the teenager as lethargy, lack of motivation for doing anything. We keep saying he's all the time sleeping, he's all the time uh, binge watching, he's all the time on a gadget, or for example, is very isolated, doesn't want to meet anybody, doesn't want to come out, he's always using an app to order food inside the house, but is never coming out to socialize. And more importantly, they are unable to uh, regulate the use of social media. They're almost all the time in social media using a false uh, ID sometimes or, you know, playing games online as an avatar, not as themselves. These are all uh, signs that, you know, somewhere they're not able to make sense of the world that they're living in. As a parent, as a teacher, it may be very important for us to identify these cues and sit with the teenager. And even if they're reluctant at first, work a little bit on helping them to nurture some relationships. We could start off with just basic quality friendships, the second type of loneliness that I mentioned, and help them to build also a network and then slowly build the intimate relationship. Because when the relationship area heals for the child, they're able to move towards higher goals. If the relationship need is not met, it's almost like water for the human body. When you when you are extremely thirsty, you don't function as well. Similarly, when there are there aren't relationships that are healthy, your emotional self becomes very very uh, uh, tired. In fact, there will be a lot of emotional exhaustion, which comes up as mental fatigue and your inability to do things in life. The third area, the third R, like you know, you have already written probably here. Uh, the first one, which is reflection, the second, which is relationships, which have the three types of loneliness, and the third area, which is extremely important again, rest. Now you may notice, why am I using a word like rest and saying it's very important? Because it has been proven in repeated studies that we are the most sleep deprived, rest de deprived generation in the whole universe, in any time in history. And why is this a big problem? Because we have a lot of distractions. We're all the time running, but we don't know why we're running. And this is where I would tell you that there are five types of rest that are very important for the teenager. Also because they have a growing brain and they're learning many things and they're struggling through their identity and all that. First is always physical rest. And physical rest, the best way of course is sleep. Apart from this, you can also, you know, just put up your feet and relax a little bit. All of those come under physical rest. And the sleep cycle that I mentioned repeatedly is that it has to be only nighttime sleep. Daytime sleep is not calculated as uh, deeply healing sleep because sleep is very important because it removes the stress hormones. The first type of rest, of course, is physical. Second type of rest is what we call mental rest. And when I say mental rest, what happens is when the child is studying, now you notice that many of them have uh, online classes and then they also have a lot of um, practicals that have to be done and things like that, a lot of pressures. They may be doing some internet uh, related IIT coaching, things like that. So when they're doing like exams, international exams, national exams, whatever they're taking up, since they do a lot of mental work, it may be important to do very short brain breaks or breaks that help you with the relaxation mentally. The third uh, rest, third type of rest that is most important is what we call sensory rest. And this is very important for this generation because all of their senses are completely in a state of arousal or a heightened level of work during these online classes. So they're using their eyes, they have to listen. They're also getting a lot of feedback from the light and things like that. So since they have so much of overstimulation of all the senses and they don't have downtime like you and I had, you and I had sports, we could go out and things like that. But the current generation does not have that. They need that sensory rest. In the absence of sensory rest, you will notice that they show symptoms of stress. They show a lot of symptoms of being very restless, very, very fidgety. These kind of things are telling you that the sensory rest is required. The fourth type of rest that is very important is emotional rest. Emotional rest is something where they become aware of their emotions and they're able to generally say, you know, I'm feeling sad, I'm feeling angry, I'd like to work with these things. And the fifth type of rest is very important, which is also social rest. For children who have a lot of, um, you know, expectations from society, and also lack of poor or lack of or poor social interaction. Social rest means a balance in their social interactions, not a deprivation of social interaction. So making social interactions more healthy is the way in which social rest is achieved. 
for people who have too much of uh, interaction with others, social rest means staying away a little bit and making time for solitude where you work on yourself. So depending on the need, this is how it's done. So the first triangle that I mentioned is the nurturing triangle or the nurture triangle, where as a parent or as a teacher, we help the child, the student, to be able to reflect, developing that through debriefing and problem solving skills. The second area that you will work is relationships, where you help them deal with the three types of loneliness. And the third area, which is most important, which is rest, the five types of rest. And the rest is something that you can always develop through de healthy routines. So modeling healthy routines and helping them develop healthy routines is something that you can do as a parent or as a teacher. And now we come to the second triangle. And again, I hope you have your pen ready. So we're going to work with the second triangle, which is called the transformation triangle. Transformation is change, okay? So this is the transformation triangle. On the first uh, corner of that, what I'd like you to do is to work on what must I avoid? I must avoid correcting my teenager, but instead of correction, I can use connection. Now, when I say correction, we grew up at a time where if we were if we made a mistake we were punished and you know correction was the most important uh, tool that was used by the adults now when they're already raised in so much of violence and so much of isolation just correction without building a relationship makes them even more uh, prone to mental health issues so this is where i would suggest connection and by connection i mean the ability to be able to re uh, relate to another person, especially with you as a parent or as a teacher. Because if you would like to build any kind of change into their body or into their routine or into their learning, into their behavior, without a connection, that may not be possible. So even the three hours that you want to bring about, if you would like to communicate with them about it, you need to have a definite connection. So the simplest technique, which I suggest, is what is called a connection ritual. Set a time with your teenager, which may be about 15 minutes a day, and it must be something both of you enjoy. Now, when you both of you enjoy this activity, it must be something like, you know, going out for a walk, playing shuttle, singing together, cooking together. It must not involve a gadget. It's not like both of us played a video game together. That cannot happen. The activity must involve a lot of conversation, a lot of connection. So when you set the connection ritual, at that time, there must not be any correction, advice, lecturing, all of those things. That's a free time with the child where the child feels extremely comfortable with you. And once you build this relationship for at least about three weeks to five weeks, then you can build on other forms of communication. So the second C here is that you will not use control, but you will use communication. Now, control again means I am the parent, I am the teacher, and therefore I tell you and you have to listen. Now, when you use control, what happens is you are stunting a lot of skills in the person, but also what you're doing is you're setting the person to manipulate. You're saying, okay, I don't want to be controlled, but let me pretend in front of you. So I'm teaching them to be fake. I'm teaching them to be manipulated. So when you start bringing about a beautiful form of communication, that changes. So you're going to replace correction with connection and con control with communication. And there are some basic rules that we use for communication. The first rule that we use in communication don't immediately decide. So today I feel like speaking to my child. I just say, come sit down. I'm telling you what I have to do. Communication is not one way, it's two way. And therefore there are basic rules, especially since you're working with a teenager, it would be good for you to note down these rules. Number one, if you decide that you're going to work with your teenager and you want to communicate with him or her, give them about 24 hours before you communicate. So let them know, I want to speak to you and we can speak tomorrow. Uh, it's eight o'clock. Uh, 8, 10, my time. So I would say tomorrow at 8 o'clock, will that be okay? So give them about 24 hours and let them know that you would like to speak to them for 10, 15 minutes and tell them what topic it is. So you can say, listen, I want to speak to you about your physics marks this year. Or I'd like to speak to you about a particular uh, issue that happened. And you know, one of your teachers has called to complain to me. So you let them know what the issue is so that they can also prepare their side of the story. In two-way communication, it's important for both of you to be equals and therefore give them that time to prepare. The third aspect, once the next day happens, the next uh, eight o'clock, 24 hours later, please sit down, switch off your phone, prioritize your child. Because if you're going to communicate with a teenager, it's important for you to be there present and let them know that you value this time with them. And once you do that, Ask them to speak first. Let them speak their points. Let them communicate what the challenges are. 
and in what they say, if there is something that can, that is true and can be accepted, let them know. See, in all these points, I liked one or two things that you said, and I'd like to make a change in it. Because what happens is this is how we model their way of cooperating with us. When you keep on controlling, when you keep putting them down, they also try to control you and put you down. So if you'd like a teenager to comply with you, the first thing is to model acceptance, model listening first and model acceptance second. The most important, be assertive. By this, I'm not saying give them whatever you want, give them whatever they're asking for. What I'm saying is listen, accept, and then tell them, see in these points, I'm willing to accept this, but these two are, are not acceptable. I would not be able to follow these two, but I'm willing to follow these two. So give them a very clear idea of what you can and cannot do, what you will and will not accept. By this, you're letting them know that in relationships, it's okay to say no, but it's also important to say yes. So you're setting that tone. If there is something very unreasonable, then you can be extremely firm and say a very, very clear no. Now, this is the way in which you communicate with the teenager. Very often what happens is we tend to control them. We already have a small friction. We feel they won't listen to us. Every time I speak to him, he shuts the door and he goes away. He gets into a power struggle or he doesn't speak to me for one whole week. I'm scared of all this tension, all this conflict that can happen. And therefore, I don't communicate at all. And another challenge that we have as parents and as teachers is if I have a problem with my child, I tell somebody else to speak to my teenager. So, you know, I tell his cousin to speak to him or I tell her aunt to speak to him or I tell the teacher, please don't use another person to communicate to your child. Because if you keep on doing this, then your relationship becomes more and more difficult for you to work on. If there is a problem with the relationship, sit with the discomfort, but please work through it. Because especially in the teenage years, your teenager needs this model because this is the age where they're learning relationships. It's very important for them to realize that I can learn to make things all right when things go wrong. Because this is the way in which they learn how all long-term relationships have to be worked on. Coming back to the triangle, the third C, we tend to compare and make them compete. And I know it's EduCafe and you know a lot of competition related things may have uh, come up when you're looking at careers, but I'd like you to understand instead of comparing and competing, one of the beautiful things that we can teach our children to do is to creatively deal with change because there will always be challenges in life. If you have lived life honestly, there have been challenges probably every day of your life. The most important thing is to find creative ways to deal with it. What we can do as a parent is to collaborate. Whenever a child makes a mistake or whenever the child is finding something challenging, support them, work with them, collaborate with them to find a solution together. You can call it co-regulation sometimes and you can also call it collaboration. The second aspect is to help them understand that this is a process. Don't always look at the outcome. This is the product. This is what I want you to do. Focus on the process. The third area, let them learn to be contributors and not just consumers. Very often what happens is we keep teaching them to consume things. Okay, I'll get you this, I'll get you that, I'll get you that. But we're not teaching them to contribute and make a contribution towards the world. So in that case, teach them to make a contribution. Now, these would be the three basic rules to help them understand how creatively challenges can be. Coming to the third triangle, the bottom uh, portion of the larger triangle, this is the triangle of balance. So we had a triangle for nurturing, triangle for transformation, and now a triangle for balance. Now the triangle for balance, I hope you're using your hands and you're writing down balance there. It has three corners again. Now this is a triangle that's extremely important because we're going to help them balance three very important things. The first corner, we would write balancing freedom and responsibility. Now, as parents, we want to give our children a lot of freedom. And I accept that, you know, in today's day and age, freedom is an important thing. But when you give freedom without a sense of responsibility, then it's just indulgence and it becomes a problem later on in life. So whenever you're working with a teenager, when you're working with freedom, it's like giving ingredients. Now, let's assume that I want to make lemon juice that I want to drink during the session. I will have a lemon, I will have water and have sugar, probably a spoon, a cup and some water. Now, each of these ingredients and each of these materials that I have have to be used in different ways. Similarly, when I give freedom, there will be many aspects of freedom and each of those have to be used in different ways. For example, I have to squeeze the lemon, I have to measure the sugar, I have to pour the water, and then I have to continue stirring all of this till it's fully mixed. 
So now when each area of my life or each aspect of my life requires different skills, if I just give freedom without responsibility, then the person does not know how to deal with all the challenges in life. So similarly with every experience, I'm just using lemon juice as an experience uh, for you to understand. I'd like you to understand that as children, if we give them the opportunity to take up small responsibilities in the house, they're able to take larger responsibilities over a period of time and they know how to use the ingredients well. Now the second triangle, of course, I'm still at the triangles here. So this triangle here, what am I going to teach them to balance? This is where you will work on external achievements and balance it with internal growth. Now we live in a very funny society where external achievements are very important. So if somebody has reached uh, you know, a certain position in society has earned a lot of money, has a lot of wealth, we consider them successful. But that external achievement, or they have a lot of power, for example, they are considered extremely uh, successful. Unfortunately, that external achievement does not help. Internal growth is also equally important. And by internal growth, I mean, you learn humility, you learn the ability to solve problems, you learn compassion, you learn to be kind, you learn a lot of qualities for yourself. Now, the, I'm going to use this plant as an example, and the dried leaf is definitely one of the reasons I left it there. Now, internal growth is like the roots of this plant, and external achievements are like these leaves. External achievements will fall away, dry away sometime. They may not always be there, but the internal growth is something that we need to focus on, even though it is not visible. I may not be able to see it. I may not be able to measure. Now, for example, if I remove this plant to see how big the roots are, the plant may not survive. Similarly, I may not be able to measure many of the internal aspects that my child develops or my adolescent develops through their life. But what I can do is to give the roots the kind of nourishment they need. So for example, I don't pour too much water and destroy the roots. By that, I mean, I don't provide so much for them that they don't know how to look for their own resources. So one kind of overprotective parenting is like that. The second danger that I uh, foresee is not give anything at all. I want you to be independent, so you do it all on your own. That kind of uh, abandonment also is very dangerous for, uh, for children. Uh, and I've seen this in a lot of children where parents say, you know, I want him to grow up strong so he will not get any support from me. That's also very dangerous. The third is, of course, the space that we need to give them for growth. If the roots do not have space to grow, they do not grow. Similarly, give them the space to grow. Let them have a balanced life. Let them have a lot of op uh, opportunities with other uh, children, with uh, exposure with other people. All of these things are very important. And the most important, nutrients. The soil needs nutrients. There will be nutrients already in the person's environment, which they will take, a lot of experiences that they will take. But what can you and I as a parent give? We can develop small habits in ourselves, which our children can pick up. That's what we call modeling. So modeling is like, for example, if I would like my child to read, I make sure that I'm reading every day. If I would like my child to exercise every day, I'm also exercising every day. So those are the nutrients that I can give my child. So I'm using this plant here to help you understand that when the roots continue to grow, though they are not visible, this balance will is what will help with external achievements. External achievements are equally important. It helps me to stay grounded. It helps me to stay in a balanced uh, way in which I can lead life. Just internal growth alone also sometimes is not enough. So helping children to be able to balance the two is the next. And the last aspect of my triangle, this corner here, you're going to add the last balance, which is extremely important again in today's day and age, the balance between information and experience. Okay, for this, I have another experiment. So I have a bowl of water, information. So what happens, this is bowl of water is information and we live in the information revolution. Now you, you go anywhere, you go on onto your phone, you have information. Earlier you had to go to a library or you had to wait for the newspaper to come the next day and things like that to find information. So now what happens is we tell children, just because I'm giving you information, you should be able to soak it up. Now, like the sponge, we expect our children's mind to just pick up all the information. Now, what is a sponge? It can only take in all this information, but it may not necessarily be able to use it well. Right? So maximum you can squeeze it, but it doesn't have any value. However, what I would ask you to do is a lot of information is present for children. What you can do is allow them to use it the way you would use a paintbrush. Okay? So I have dipped a little bit of uh, the paintbrush a little bit in water, and then that is information. The second what they will do is they will uh, 
uh, tip it into their own experience. So they can decide, I want to use it for, um, you know, I want to experience this or I want to experience that. And they may want to try their own hand at it. Okay. Now, why I'm using this is when children choose, so one child may choose this experience, another child may use another experience. If you as a parent or as a teacher, you feel that the experience chosen by the child is wrong, what you can do is to continue using the same information, but in a more supportive way so that they can undo the effects of what they've done, but more with your support. You can dilute this. I hope I'm making sense. I'm using this as an analogy because learning is experience and all of you will be able to relate to this experience. So as a parent, when I'm able to help them make a balance between these areas, the balance triangle also works. So we work with the nurturing triangle, we work with the transformational triangle, and we work with the uh, third triangle, which is the balance triangle. So when you work with these three triangles, what will happen is you have the fourth triangle, which is, in my opinion, the most important. It's something that the children themselves will learn. So what I'd like you to do with the entire triangle, now that you've written everything, I'd like you to now make a triangle, like a pyramid like this. So when you fold it, when you actually fold it this way, right? So when you fold it, it becomes a pyramid. I hope all of you are able to make this pyramid. Now, this pyramid is very, very significant because it's Abraham Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Okay, I'm bringing it closer to the camera. If you can see there are uh, areas there. The base of the uh, pyramid is the basic needs of hunger and thirst and things like that. Once they are met, the second area goes uh, the safety needs where the person needs basic safety. The third are belonging needs, the fourth are esteem needs, and the fifth, of course, self-actualization. If as a parent, as a teacher, I am able to work well with the nurturing triangle, the transformation triangle, and the balance triangle, children on their own will know how to deal with their needs and how to deal with them. I hope the session was useful for you, and I'm sorry, though it's virtual, I hope we were able to make a connection because that's the most significant aspect of today. And Revati is going to help me out with the questions that you may have put up on the chat. So I'd be happy to interact by taking some of your questions. EduCafe is digital this year. Golf Mathimum presents EduCafe Season 6.